I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Praise be Jesus Christ. Now and forever. Welcome, everyone, once again to the next installment in the series called The Healing Wounds of Christ. I'm here with the Reverend Joseph Henchy of the Congregation of the Sacred Stigmata. Hello once again, Father. Hello, Lisa. Nice sharing with you. And this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Alleluia. Alleluia. Well, before you begin today's lecture, um, could you tell us a little bit about where we left off and Surely. what you what we can expect for this one? All these massive reflections that are going on now, I think this is our 40th episode, uh, based on the Sacred Heart devotion as applied to the the biblical theology of divine love and the Trinity. So in this introductory section, we're looking at the Sacred Heart and Trinitarian love. And then the Sacred Heart, ad intra and ad extra. We've done all that. And then doing the Sacred Heart and the divine indwelling. The Sacred Heart and missionary spirituality. The Sacred Heart and mercy. The Sacred Heart and divine hesed. Hesed is a uh, Hebrew term which a well-known, well, not so well-known biblical scholar by the name of Professor Gluck who wrote a book on Hesed the nat- as the nature of God. It's probably translated as merciful love. I see. And it's that link that brought me to these reflections after studying at some length the wounds, the sacred stigma of Christ then seeing this close connection with the Sacred Heart Devotion, we look at it as the Latin indwelling in the Greek, uh, the Hebrew, has said the very nature of God. And presently we're working on the Sacred Heart Devotion and the divine indwelling. Mm-hmm. Maybe I could explain that in human terms. When a man loves a woman or a child loves his or her mother and father, there is that permanence of uh, uh, sensation or experience of profound filial love or marital love, uh, sponsor love. Well, the divine indwelling is something like that. It's a, it's a, a, a true grace. It is the grace of God within us. It's also divine charity. Grace being what the theologians call an entative habit. It's like plugging in the computer then charity would be the operative habit. Once it's plugged in, it leads directly to works of love. So it's taking theology, well known from other sources, and applying it to the sacred heart, or applying the sacred heart to these, this theology of the Trinity or the theology of God. Well, if I might ask you a very personal question, mm-hmm. Father. Do you feel that kind of indwelling in your own life? No, there is. I think once in a while there's a spiritual consolation yeah. Or something like that, of which there are not many. I remember St. Paul of the Cross, I don't think ever had one. I don't yeah. know, but anyway, he was much imbued with the cross. But I think once in a while, there's a great happiness we all experience, either as students or as believers. Maybe some devotion, I don't know. I, I think back over the long years, I remember the famous canonization of St. Pius X on a beautiful May day of 1954, and the image is still alive to me. So it's something like that. Like that. It, it influences in the Thomistic sense both thinking and willing. There is a kind of a realization of the things of faith and a, a gratitude or a gratefulness or to act on them. And so when you when you say um, it, that sense of um, of joy or happiness, I, if I have experienced it sometimes, I would call it a, a sense of overwhelming peace. That's fair. Bishop, yeah. Sheen, uh, Bishop Sheen used to talk about peace of mind and peace of heart. Yeah. That would be something like it. I mean, it's these are just descriptions of mystical reality, so it's not easy to get any one word. Mm-hmm. So it would be to be happily in love, to have a great sense of peace, 
or maybe once in a while when God blessed our works and we have a sense of accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Or I used to find it sometimes studying. You know, you came across a new thought and it really seemed to fit in what you knew right. before. Or even trying to pray. Once in a while saying the beads, I don't know, you get a kind of a thought into the mysteries. It's, it's nothing tangible and I don't think we should aim for it. But in the Dominican or the Thomistic understanding of divine indwelling, it involves both ontology and also uh, spirituality, or I should put it, intellect and will, grace and charity. I understand. Well, thank you, thank you. And mm-hmm. so I'll let you begin with a prayer and then and then take us away. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Mary, Mother of God. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, Father, I'll let you start where you like. We ended up on the description of the indelible character of priesthood, which the Church has described as a web of relationships, as in uh, Pastora's Tabo Vobis, I think it's number 12. But uh, there is this sense of a web of relationships also in priestly, baptismal, and confirmational character. And it's described in Sacrosanctum Concilium 12, Lumen Gentium 10, and so on. And then there is this indwelling of the Most Blessed Trinity, which we took from number 1024 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is the realization of salvation happens in the final glorification of each one in a blessed eternity. It'll be this perfect life with the Most Holy Trinity, this communion of life with the Trinity, with the Virgin Mary, the angels, and all the blessed. It's called heaven. Heaven is the ultimate end and fulfillment of the deepest human longings, the state of definitive and supreme happiness. So the indwelling would be a glimpse of that in some form or shape or other. Maybe an intuitive person would see it as creation, creation of, of some thought or idea that he or she would have. So, the salvation of individual creatures is not left up to chance or to human whim. It's an infallible fulfillment of the free choice of both God and the free acceptance of a believer, of an eternal plan which the mind and heart of the Most Blessed Trinity has conceived in mercy. If the Lord has set his heart on you, we read in Deuteronomy 7.7, 7, it is because he loved you. We know, as we read with Saint uh, mm. Exodus 33, we know that by turning everything to their good, God cooperates with those who love him, with all those he has called according to his purpose. They are the ones he chose specially long ago and intended to become true images, icons, of his son, so that his son might be the eldest of many brothers and sisters. Excuse me, that's Romans 8, 28 to 30. Those he called, he justified. And with those he justified, he surely wanted his glory. I have mercy on whom I will, and show pity on whom, to whom I please. In other words, when God wants us to show mercy, he does. When he wants to harden one's heart, he does. And this, of course, is a problem for us to understand, but it's the Old Testament idea of every aspect of our willing and thinking and so on is from God. Yes, well, that is a a hard idea to understand. I think one of the first places where I can remember it confusing me is the Exodus story itself, where Moses goes to Pharaoh and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. You think, why would he do that? It is a, a way of, of speaking. Theologically, there's some kind of understanding that we cannot think or will or anything without the choice of God. Even, very paradoxically, we cannot even sin unless in some way God moves us within, says St. Thomas. He does it always for greater good. He yeah. doesn't choose the evil, he chooses the greater good. So it's a bit of mystery and 
Yes. Maybe we like, we've uncovered a, a can of worms. <laughs> well, I don't know. And it would just as a, a tiny little aside, mm-hmm. um, one of my hospice patients who is um, very weak right now said to me the other day, why do I open my eyes at a certain moment of time? Why do I close my eyes at another moment in time? I think it's God. He has a big job. <laughs> and, you know, because if, if you think of God mm-hmm. opening and closing all the eyes of the world, mm-hmm. uh, the, the thoughts mm-hmm. that go through all our minds, yeah. Yeah, God has a big job. I'm sure there are people who could see that, the simplicity of childhood, unless yeah. you be come as children, you cannot enter the kingdom. And it seems that dear sister's well on her way. She is, I think. So the church works for the salvation of each and every one. That's its purpose. It's a main purpose. There was no one unimportant to her. There is no such reality as a church of charity and one of law. They're both the same. Law is a gift of charity. A church of John and one of Peter or a charismatic church and an institutional church, or a church of Christ to be followed by one of the Holy Spirit. These have all been either ors rejected by the, ch- by the church. There can be no opposition or repugnance between the invisible mission of the Holy Spirit and the juridical office that the shepherds on the call that the doctors and doctoresses receive from Jesus Christ. So the juridical office of a shepherd is no different from that task that the doctors and doctor wretches receive from Jesus Christ. The sacraments are powers, we believe, that comes forth from the body of Christ, an extension of the incarnation, which is ever-living and ever-life-giving. The actions of the Holy Spirit at work in his body, the Church, they are the masterworks of God in this new and everlasting covenant, as the New Catechism put it, number 1116. It is through the sacraments that believers are sanctified. The body of Christ is built up. God is worshipped. The sacraments not only presuppose faith, but by words and objects they nourish, strengthen, and express the faith. That is why they are called sacraments of the faith by the Catechism number 1123. In all of this, the Church is simply continuing the work of Jesus Christ and serves as His minister. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior for mankind were revealed, it was not because He was concerned with any righteous actions we might have done for ourselves. It was for no other reason except His own compassion that He saved us by means of cleansing water, of rebirth, and renewing us with the Holy Spirit, which he has done so generously, poured over us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. He did this so that we would be justified by grace to become heirs looking forward to inheriting eternal life. This is a doctrine you can rely on, St. Paul wrote to Titus, chapter 3. Yes, yes. As appears clearly from this classical text of the Apostle, In the process of the formation of the mystical body of Christ, as in the formation of his physical body, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all exercise their role. The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph. The Lord is with you, he said. You are to you and to bear a son, the Son of the Most High. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. This is all taken from Luke chapter 1, verses 30 to 35. So in this manner, all the three divine presences recur, concur in this exercise of the divinity, ad extra, in the salvation of each and every one. Even though sanctification is often preferentially appropriated or attributed to the Holy Spirit as more in accord with his personal attributes. This is just a theological application of the words of Scripture. In all of the activities that extra, creation, redemption, sanctification, the works are common to all three divine persons. The Spirit proceeds from the Father and, or through the Son, in the guise of personal love. The Holy Spirit comes as the first and principal gift that the Father can give and make through the Son. 
to an intellectual creature. He gives of himself, communicates himself, shares the inner life of the Most Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, and a loving, merciful love toward creatures is always the ultimate and proper reason for every gratuitous gift. It's the Holy Spirit at, active within us. So the Apostle will pro- proclaim this sublime doctrine in exultant terms in Romans 5. Our hope is not deceptive, because the love of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. So by the law of concomitance, wherever Mm -hmm. there's a spirit, there's the Father and the Son. Wherever there's the Father, so also by concomitance, there's the Son and the Holy Spirit. And wherever the Son is, by concomitance, there's the Father and the Spirit. We were still helpless when at the appointed moment Jesus died for us, Romans 5.5. In virtue of this extraordinary gift, the Holy Spirit in person, participated in through grace, many other gifts are appropriated and distributed to the members of Jesus Christ. There are many gifts and one Holy Spirit. Because of the eminent personal attributes of the third person of the Most Blessed Trinity, some preference has been shown in appropriating the divine indwelling to the Most Holy Spirit. We say the indwelling of the Spirit or the indwelling of the Trinity. The reason is because of the eminent application of the very personal properties of the third person of the Most Blessed Trinity. Nonetheless, this divine indwelling is the work of the entire Most Blessed Trinity. The Holy Spirit is the first gift. He is also the soul of the mystical body of which Christ is the head. To him is attributed the divine works of inspiration as initiating sanctification through grace and charity. Yet all three persons cooperate in these in equal manner as the efficient cause and the trinity of persons is present really, substantially and personally in the believers and in the church through the life of grace. So these are theological terms of enormous sublimity and we say them like rattling off a tobacco auction but it's an extraordinary truth of our faith. It is also true that the Holy Spirit is manifest in his effects in the visible mission of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is invisible, he's a spirit. But yet with the wind blowing and people talking in tongues and extraordinary things happen, the Spirit is present. I think we've experienced this maybe once in a while in I remember being with Mother Teresa once, hate to be a name dropper at a retreat I had just given to some of her sisters, and it was an extraordinary sense of being in the presence of something much bigger than I. Uh-huh. And, and I'm sure I was. So the risen Christ also carries on an invisible mission that has its foundation in the eternal generation in the bosom of the Father. For example, at Christmas Eve, we have the Mass at midnight celebrating the eternal birth of Jesus in the bosom of the Father. We have the Mass at dawn, remembering the birth of Jesus from the Blessed Virgin Mary. Then we have the Mass during the day, commemorating the infusion of the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, into our souls and the indwelling of the Trinity through divine grace. This mission is his advent in the human being, in the Church, through grace and charity and the gift of wisdom. The Holy Spirit, sent by the Father and through the Son, through his invisible mission, reflects in time the eternal spiration that unites him to the other two persons. It's a breath of love that Mm. unites them, mutual love. As essential love, it is God himself. Personal love is the love of the Holy Spirit. So in an an effort to reach the ultimate source of sanctification that is achieved in each one through grace and charity, in ways sometimes of which the Church knows nothing, 1257, the salvation of an infant that dies with baptism, or the, the salvation of a man in sin dying on the way to confession. Mm-hmm. He's already sorry. We have to leave that to the mercy of God. And even those cases where it seems that somebody died in sin, the church prays for that person till the end of time. Right. <clears throat> so the Most Holy Trinity gives the baptized, sanctifying grace, the grace of justification, from the New Christ Catechism. This is a beautiful section of the Catechism. Well, it's all a beautiful section, but 
this life in Christ and the life from the, that comes to us from the sacraments. So, without charity that comes to humanity through God, one and three, the mystery of holiness and the intimate love of God within us would have no explanation or no possibility. Faith and hope, while being theological virtues, are not enough to bring the intimate life of the Trinity within, as there is still needed a theological infusion of charity. This is a very sad feature of our theology, I think. We could have faith, believe in God, believe in His law, and not be willing to accept it. We could have hope in the mercy of God, but not today. We don't want to be saved today. We want to continue sinning. So you could have faith and hope and no charity, but you cannot have divinely infused charity unless you have faith and hope. Mm -hmm. So therefore, many deeds that might seem very generous in the end might be nothing better than a tax break. You know, yeah. all intentions important, and all of it we leave to God and His judgment. Well, and that is a bit of the of the difference, is it not, between charity as as expressed by deeply faithful Christian people, and social justice. Yeah. Uh, not that there is anything wrong no, with social no. justice, which is motivated to mm -hmm. the good sure. of others, mm -hmm. but that is different mm -hmm. than, what, yeah. than what we mm -hmm. are talking about mm -hmm. here. And, I, and it reminds me of something I believe Pope Francis mm -hmm. wrote, trying to encourage mm -hmm. us to distinguish and not be social workers, mm -hmm. but to be Christians mm -hmm. in love yeah. and charities, which, you know, he's trying to help draw that yeah. distinction, right? Which I think, though, with the great social teaching of the Church, we mean a social justice that's motivated by charity, that's motivated by divine grace. Because I think people could have a vague, confused idea of social justice, even if they believed in nothing. Right. There's a kind of fair play that's sure. almost inherent in most of us. It's just I think it's unfair what's happening to certain people. But what we mean is the work of God, carrying the work of God, the message of salvation and promising eternal life. Not to the extent which in this life is lousy, let's just hope for the future. We're citizens of both worlds, and Vatican II with its uh, uh, Argentes and Lumen Gentium and uh, um, Gaudium et Spes make it very clear we're citizens of both cities and we owe something to each of these cities. So the gift of grace is looked upon as an entative reality. It elevates us to the le elevating the level of the human soul. This, though, needs to become operative through the faculties. For example, we could say the human soul is a principle of life, intellectual and and uh, spiritual. But when we're sleeping, it's not very active. But mm -hmm. the life continues. So that entative habit needs to become operational. And that's why it begins with the supreme faculties of intellect and will. Yes. So, and therefore, the the virtues of these faith and hope are in the will. Uh, excuse me. Faith is in the mind. The will is uh, and hope are in the will. So charity is inspired into the human will. Divine charity transforms the human will and makes its influence also felt in hope and faith and in the human intelligence. This, it, thus it does primarily through the gift of wisdom that intensifies as one lives charity. This is very interesting because old Father Garrigo often stressed the teaching of St. Thomas, the best theology is the state of grace. Mm -hmm. Many people can become eloquent, or many political and almost uh, diabolical people who have been eloquent. I mean, I think of Stalin and... Uh, and Hitler was a great orator by the sounds of things. I never, I heard him once in German on the, on the radio, but I mean, hearing a tape of him. But that they yeah. are, uh, but you say that they are eloquent, but they obviously are not in a state of grace. Well, they're not certainly pr promoting Christianity or, mm. Christ or the Christian message or Christian social justice. Hitler's whole thing was to make a better Germany. Right. By removing and killing other people and so on. So this brings about the very special presence of the most blessed Trinity called indwelling or inhabitation. The Trinity is present in a special way. The human intelligence and will as the object of knowledge and love. So we think better thoughts. 
baptism, we think oh, one of the names of baptism is illumination. Mm -hmm. You can look at another person and say, I don't like him because he's not like me. Whereas Charlie will say, this person is a son or daughter of Jesus, of God, so we should love him and so on and treat him as a creature of God. So in order for the sublime mystery of the indwelling to be translated to the grasp of human beings, the world of symbols plays a role as the cross, as the sacred heart, as the stigmata. This knowledge of the indwelling is almost experiential as a reality truly present, just exactly what that means is not already always clear. I think it just means a kind of a spiritual consolation or some special insight into a mystery or a realization that God has blessed something we try to do with the best of intentions or sometimes he blesses us for a quiet holy hour. Not always. I think he always does, we just don't always feel it. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a feeling, it, it's, it's both experiential and spiritual. It's a reality that is truly present, that enables one to experience connaturally the mind and heart of God through assimilation and transformation. In a certain sense, we could look at the Most Blessed Trinity, the dogma, as a halfway measure between monotheism and pantheism. Mm. That God is one, but there are three persons in the one God. Or you could look at God as my special friend who dwells within me. It's not like being on a bus. You don't know anybody else on the bus. When Christ indwells in us, he's not getting a bus ride. He comes as a friend and challenges us into his friendship. There is a certain possession of truth and goodness, and with it sometimes comes enjoyment, joy, the foretaste of an eternal happiness. This is where service of God leads to friendship with God that lasts forever. So Jesus offers this response from his last supper with his own. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we shall come to him and make our home with him. him. John mm -hmm. 14, 23. Well, theologians find a problem here, because God made us, he's already with us. Well, there are different ways of indwelling. He can be here by causality, we are the effects of God, or he can be here as a friend, in which we, to, with whom we enter into dialogue. A few verses earlier, Jesus had already promised his spirit, if you love me, keep my commandments, actions speak louder than words. And I shall ask the Father, and he will give you another paraclete to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. He is with you. He is in you, John 14, 15 to 17. St. Paul reminded the Romans of this enormous gift of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He said, the, whole, the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us, Romans 5, 5, very challenging text. So the Holy Spirit pours this into us, this participation in the life of the Trinity. So again, from the words of our Savior, it seems evident that not even intimate contact with the Father and the Son is possible for our intelligence. If our contemplation of the truth proceeds only from trans tra abstract truth and not from the charity of the three divine persons and towards all those whom they love, the devotion to the Trinity must lead to love of one another. That's not genuine. Mm -hmm. It's just not an abstract religion. It's a religion of sublime dogma meant to be translated into positive action of charity and forgiveness. Only charity is capable of conforming the human spirit to the Spirit of God, of rendering it capable of an intimate knowledge, one that is penetrating. We sometimes speak of the experience of Christ. Well. Oftentimes people experience that when they will make a good confession. Mm -hmm. There is a kind of a peace that comes to the soul, some slight indication, it could be accompanied with others, a sign of predestination. Not that we can engineer these things, sometimes God just gives them to us, great sense of peace. Or we can be inspired by a natural beauty, look out at the sky and praise its maker. Or sometimes by human music. We can really be elevated in mind and heart as one of the gifts that God gives us through the genius of composers and so on. But like you say, in, in order to experience at some level the indwelling of the Trinity, 
we have to make room for mm -hmm. it in our houses. Just like when a when a guest comes to my house, I have mm -hmm. to take all the piles of things off the chairs mm -hmm. so they have somewhere mm -hmm. to sit. Mm -hmm. So this is like you've talked to us before in some of this to um, reorient our lives away mm -hmm. from the clutter and mm -hmm. and the things that would debase us mm -hmm. in order to offer a a cleaner, emptier place for the for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to take That's up residence. Saint, Saint Paul had an idea yeah. for that third psalm every Saturday afternoon. Christ emptied himself and became one of us. We need to be empty of ourselves so that we could have all three of them mm -hmm. as dwellers, indwellers into our life. These are all metaphors and imperfect language, but they do in some way indicate what we are uh, what what we are going through. <clears throat> Knowledge of this kind is called by theologians to be an affinity, a kind of connaturality. We are elevated to the nature of God, certainly just a participation in it, a kind of a metaphor, an analogy, in which is more distance and proximity, but this is otherwise we have no language we can use. There's a reality grasped by the intelligence, yearned for or loved by the will. We have certain thoughts or convictions that come to us. We put our life on the line for the promise of being faithful in the family. Or, I think, as priests and religious, we try to keep those perpetual vows till we die. So it is necessary to keep in mind that God is charity of his very essence. <clears throat> Therefore, the Father and the Divine Word are not abstract entities. While they may be thought of as wisdom generating and wisdom generated, but not in some kind of abstract intellectual speculation. This is not, this is not for philosophical wisdom. This is what the medieval, medieval theologians call sapida scientia, scientia sapientia, meaning a knowledge that is sweet. It's a knowledge according to the ultimate causes of reality, one that needs to accompany charity and needs to be permeated by charity. This loving being, truth, goodness, and wisdom compenetrate each other in a mutual indwelling and being. Distinct as persons, they are identical in those absolute traits. The one word that assume, assumes all of these would be God, the deity, deity, or whatever. So it is said that one cannot love without first knowing. This is what St. Thomas said. But St. Boniface may point out the reverse here is also true. You cannot know the Trinity profoundly unless you love the three divine persons ardently. In order to know the divine persons properly and profoundly, in order to penetrate the secrets of the Father's loving generation of truth and the Father's and the Son's truthful, sapiential, spiration of personal love, all three divine persons need to be loved. And those who love offend us. Those who have offended us need to be forgiven. St. John penetrates these sublime realities better than any once. He's anyone else, he writes. My dear people, let us love one another since love comes from God and anyone who loves is begotten by God. Anyone who fails to love can never have known God because God is love. We ourselves have known and put our faith in God's love towards ourselves. God is love and anyone who lives in love lives in God and lives in Him. It comes down to keeping the commandments. That's all find, found in John 4. St. Augustine, a serious sinner of the early church, among the fathers of the church, is one who pondered the Trinity as deeply as any. He wrote 12 books on it. My. Very, very sublime. And I think the first seven are a real nutcracker sweet. He starts maybe in book eight to kind of mellow a bit and perhaps ordinary plebeians we can begin to understand. He has written more deeply as anyone and more profoundly than most. He maintained that it is possible to come to some understanding of the terms of the invisible mission of Son, of the Son, in the knowledge and perception of His origin from the Father. We can, we could do that, but he said it's possible. But one has deep contact with the invisible mission of the Son when this is somewhat known and perceived. This cannot be some kind of purely theoretical, abstract knowledge. It needs to be, be be more than a sapiential experience of the Trinity. Many of the 
theologians can be extraordinarily glib. Mm -hmm. But if the theology of the Trinity does not lead to love and to forgiveness and to self-acceptance despite whatever imperfections we have, it's not genuine. It, it leads to pride. As we know, prayer without study gets funny, and study without prayer gets proud. Vatican II challenges all believers to grow in faith, and this can only be achieved by contemplation, study, experience of revealed truth, and heeding the magisterium in De Verbum 8. This is founded for the great Dr. Augustine in that intimate similarity between the subject known and the knowing subject in the act of understanding. In some way, we become what we learn, or what we learn becomes part of us. It's, it's part of our repertoire. Love cannot be extraneous to this. The worst thing that we strive to grasp in faith is the knowledge of love. So in the light of these reflections, these sublime reflections of St. Augustine, St. Thomas pondered the intimate, invisible tie that exists between the presence of the Father in the soul and the state, in the state of grace and charity, between the invisible mission of the Son and love for him and for the Father. There is a Trinitarian love. In fact, one of the exercises they would give us as young novices is try to ponder a little bit the most blessed Trinity. And you begin with Jesus Christ. Whoever sees me sees the Father. So take whatever favorite aspect of the one mystery of Christ. For us, it has been the stigmata. Look at that deeply and see that as a revelation of God's love. The production of grace pertains also to the Father who by grace indwells within us as to the Son and Holy Spirit. I remember long years ago, there was an assassination against President Truman. Mm. And at that time, there was a group of, I think, Puerto Rican, I forget what, they were assassins. Well, the president was, they were fixing the White House. And he went with his honor guard after lunch across the street, and he was met there by this killer. And the man picked up his gun and was five feet from the president and pulled the trigger and a Secret Service agent took the bullet and died. Oh. Yeah. And there's a little plaque there. It's it's a meditation. It really is a meditation. So uh, this this self-giving, total self-giving is a, 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 a what Christ did on Calvary. This is an image of what Christ did for you and for me. The Son is indeed the Word, but it is not just any kind of Word, but a personal Word who spirates love. It's not just being glib, it's being deeply caring for the other. Therefore, the Son is not sent just for just, with a kind of perfecting of the human intellect, but only for the instruction from which love bursts forth. This is unique ex perception called experiential knowledge, properly called by theologians to be a sweet knowledge, a knowledge that is delightful. And I think in these long years of trying to study St. Thomas and theology and the scriptures, there is a, a certain delight in it. I think still now in twilight years in, in, in sacred reading, there still is something of an insight that comes when you see the efforts of other people trying to fathom the same mysteries that I live with. As to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the soul of the just, this is the effect of the invisible mission starting through the, from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. Theology teaches the intimate bond between grace and charity. Grace is entitative and charity is operative. Grace elevates us to the capacity and love then activates that elevation. But always coexist. They are proper to the third person. St. Thomas has taught that the soul, through grace, becomes more and more in conformity to God. It's interesting, the old rabbis believed we are made to the image and likeness of God. We understand those today as tautology or a repetition of the same idea. But many would see that we're made in creation to the image of God. We become his likeness by living his word. It's a neat way of understanding it, and I think it does stand up to reflection. Therefore, in order for it to be said that one divine person is sent by a creature, sent to a creature, it is necessary that this creature, by some gift of grace, needs to become similar, connatural to the divine person who has been sent. So with the Father, we try to be creative. 
with the Son, we really try to be self-giving. With the love of the Holy Spirit, we try really to be compatible with others and to make them feel at home in our presence. Since the Holy Spirit is love through the mediation of charity, the human soul becomes similar to him. Therefore, in the reality of charity, one receives the mission of the Holy Spirit. Well, it's interesting that you you say all this. It's sparking a a, a thought in my own mind um, about uh, how how I would even conceive of the Trinity, and it's a, a bit in alignment uh, with your, what you're saying. Although I'm sure much more simplistic mm. than than Saint Thomas or Augustine would would say. But when when a wonderful opportunity comes my way, mm. the chance to meet a marvelous person to have a, an incredible experience i that it, it feels like an, an act of creation in my life i often i naturally thank god the father mm-hmm. i don't think about it as a creative ex- thing but i mm-hmm. i thank god the father or if i create something a, a drawing or a poem or something i uh, or a, a speech i thank god the father when when I am doing something that is um, that needs the inspiration to do it better, to spend time with a difficult person, to um, work through a difficult challenge, I always ask for the help of Christ. Mm-hmm. Or if I if I do something that is a, a charitable thing, I I thank Christ for the chance to follow Him. And sometimes I've had the experience where I will say something in response to someone that I am amazed I said, that these words came out of my mouth. And I think to myself, this could only have come as a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's like, it's like the Holy Spirit has taken over my tongue and made me say something that I would not have said otherwise. So that, that sense of creation operating in my life, I think of as the Father, the sense of action in my life mm-hmm. as as thankfulness and supported by the Son and this s- overall arching mm-hmm. attitude or mm-hmm. spiritual direction I think of as the Holy Spirit. So well, I guess that's a bit of what you're saying too, isn't it? It is, because any good person is the bearer of the Word of God, the Christopher, the bearer of Christ. Any good person does that, so to be open to friendship and to be willing to accept others who are struggling with something, trying to bring some light into their lives. And I think it helps us to understand the enormous difficulty that mystical people had trying to explain this. And like if you <clears throat> took the four master major works of John of the Cross, the ascent of Mount Carmel, the dark night of the soul, the uh, spiritual canticle, and the living flame of love, this is a kind of a progression using terms like flame. Mm -hmm. Flame has, it purifies, it enlightens, it warms, it cleanses, and it cauterizes a wound, for example. Mm -hmm. Or air comes into our lungs, we breathe it. Well, that's what we do with faith, hope, and love. So you can appreciate all the more the tremendous difficulty the mystics had and the wonderful way they met it. They tell us these truths in terms around us, in terms of creation, is what John of the Cross uses, basically. Or St. Francis of Sales, his great writings on, on, on uh, zoo- uh, not zoology, biology, the mm-hmm. flowers of the field and the rains and all of the sunlight and the moonlight. <laughs> so it is, it, it's an effort to describe the ineffable. Yes. That's what it is. So, St. <clears throat> Thomas then teaches us that through grace we need to become conformed, more similar, more connatural to the divine presence. So without charity... There's no hope for one even to think of living a share of the incarnate life of God, intimate life of God. So charity, it becomes a second nature, as it were, connatural. One rejoices in the access to the secrets also of the knowledge of God, which culminates in the eternal generation of the Word of God, from whom personal love spirates. Charity is the love of God, whose, uh, whose God is immutable, unchanging. He's goodness itself. But the very fact that God is loved, God finds himself in one who loves with the most noble of his effects, effects, according to what John teaches. Anyone who lives in love lives in God, and God lives in him. 
So love is a very good starting point. You, know, you may not have it perfected yet, but love, loving the difficult person or putting up with the aggressive person when you might have many other things you'd rather do and somebody needs or wants your attention to sacrifice for that person is an act of God, certainly. Well, and it reminds me again of something we talked about just the other day when when my, my patient, the nun, uh, in her great, great weakness, managed to get out of her mouth a, a sentence to me. She said, I am conscious you are very much like God. And I, th- I was quite taken aback by what she said. Of course, made me very teary. And when I told you what she had said, you said, of course, she said that God is love. And that's what you're doing by accompanying her at this stage of life. So I think it, experiences like that and listening to what you say and Scripture says, it, it helps me to understand better the, the great action of God in our lives, that it is in these whispers, and, and, we, and we keep the wind blowing. Well, it reminds me again of this experience of yours as what I was trying to say before, these little moments of special intimacy with God that comes to us as, as peace or a loving acceptance or deeper understanding. And uh, it, it really is the word of God speaking to us through, through others. And we know that these things are very passing. Then we get back to regular life when maybe people are not so kind to us sometimes. But in the long range, this is why we're here, to try to make other people's lives a little bit better because we pass this way. Yes, well, and I I often think that sometimes in life we have this experience like going through an airport. We we live in Chicago, so if you go to Midway Airport to get through that huge airport, there are a series of moving sidewalks. Mm -hmm. And when you're walking on the moving sidewalk, you're going really fast and you feel very light. And then the sidewalk comes to an end, and you step off and (laughs) you feel heavy again and i think that Mm. sometimes that happens in the spiritual life you you just are moved along Mm. as if you're on this light sidewalk and then Mm. and then it it passes and you step off reality and you're just uh, a normal heavy human again well it reminds me you know lisa of the teaching of saint thomas the indwelling of the most blessed trinity is a non-tological reality but it has a psychological aspect through the intellect or the will, either faith, hope, or love, or in some way. So I think these experiences are a sense of connaturality with the other person. And I think in many of these instances, especially with sister who's really dying and has been for some weeks and months, that <clears throat> she's close to God and she communicates these inner thoughts that she has in the simplest, simple language of a child, yes. of a believing child. And yes. To me, that's progress. Yes. The progress in the spiritual life. Well, and of course, the other thing she always says to me is, how is Father Henchy? So... You must be ashamed. <laughs> uh. Anyway, the eternal generation of the divine word is one that flows from the spontaneously, eternally loving will of God. Due to this mutual influence of truth and goodness, mind and heart in God, the terms of the, the, terms of the mystery of the Trinity can only be but stuttered when one strives to contemplate out of love through the medium of the gift of the Holy Spirit of wisdom. The Divine Son is a reflection of the glory of God, like the transfiguration, a perfect copy of his substance, as we read in Hebrews 1, an emanation of his very being of truth and love. These sublime thoughts of later theological reflection seem to have been already hinted at in the extraordinary prolonged prologue of John's Gospel, as well as in Paul's equally famous prologue to his epistle to the Ephesians. As we read in Romans 5, uh, Revelations 5, 1, Is there anyone worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? For there was no one in heaven, on earth, or even under the earth, who was able to open that scroll and to read it. But then I saw a lamb that seems to have been sacrificed, the seven spirits of of God sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals 
and break the seals of it because you were sacrificed and with your blood you brought men for God of every race, language, people and nation and made of them a line of kings and priests and prophets to serve our God and the rule to rule the earth. Therefore, the wounded side of Christ opens up for contemplation, for the contemplation of the church, the sacred heart devotion of Jesus, to Jesus. The imagery enables the contemplative believer to ponder the wealth of this mystery of the most blessed Trinity. From pondering on the Trinity itself, faith leads the believer to reflect on this august Trinitarian presence within each and every one. The divine indwelling with the Trinity is the culminating reality of the life of grace in our lives. So therefore, in a certain sense, the Sacred Heart is the symbol of the Trinity. These concepts are not much in good order. I'm thinking now of the Sacred Heart devotion and eschatology, and maybe it would be more orderly to put here, for example, the Sacred Heart and missionary spirituality and so on. And then there's another whole caption on the the Sacred Heart and Mercy, and so on and so on. But I'll take them as they come in the works that I follow. Well, and and I think as you have been going through all of this for us, it helps us to understand that you can... The Sacred Heart is like a, a diamond with a thousand mm-hmm. facets, mm-hmm. and you can you can take one facet at a time. Mm-hmm. No one facet captures mm-hmm. the entirety of the diamond. And as you as you look at it piece by piece... You know, necessarily, you talk about some of the same ideas, but mm-hmm. from a different angle, mm-hmm. the the sun glints That's off right. it differently. Right. It's a good, very good image, like the church windows uh, <clears throat> being darkened when it's dark outside, but outside they come to life with a beautiful light on them, or the light, the sunlight shining through them, they take on a brand new life. <clears throat> so it is true that we get these these very special insights into the divinity from other people and because of God's grace at work within us. So therefore, this brings up the point of all of our Christian life. Where does this lead? Yes. What is all of this for? Yes. Well, we think that the best of our core naturality should be eternal. Mm -hmm. We should be together with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, with anyone whom we have loved and anyone who may have loved us. And we together, as Cardinal Newman says so beautifully in his lead, Kindly Light, these precious faces we've loved and lost for a while, we'll find again in the love of the risen Lord. It's a great mystery, but uh, it's something we do put our, our faith in, our hope, and our love. So the Sacred Heart not only commemorates what was done a long time ago, it is a manifestation today of the eternal love of God, one and triune, to whom is due the plan of creation, redemption, and sanctification. Nor is the heart of Jesus simply a commemoration of the wonders of the created universe. Like St. Thomas had a beautiful summa. Mm -hmm. The synoptic gospels are a summary. But it's not only that. It's the summary in the summa, meditated and lived on and so on. So the heart of Jesus just doesn't commemorate the wonders of nature. It brings us to live them and to appreciate them further. The splendor of the new creation of salvation. It's not just the beauty of an interior life or the the uh, happiness of peace of mind and conscience. It's really the sanctification of the Holy Spirit at work in us. Metaphorically, the heart of God is certainly behind the centuries and generation upon generations of preparation for universal redemption worked by Jesus Christ in the fullness of time by sending his Holy Spirit of love, the new advocate for humanity. This is a line of of, uh, extraordinary realities and you could almost take them one by one, much like a jeweler when he picks up with his little tweezers, picks up each jewel, you could meditate and ponder on them all. So this course is just an attempt to put a lot of this material together for whatever good it might accomplish. <clears throat> so therefore, the Holy Spirit of love, this new advocate for our humanity, it's not enough either to think of the sacred heart as the church's preferred demonstrative sign of divine love dwelling within our hearts. The Trinity dwells in every single individual according also to his or her gifts. Through sanctifying grace, Christian charity, and the gift of wisdom. So the Trinity dwells right now in each and every individual through sanctifying grace, Christian charity, and the gift of wisdom. 
The Sacred Heart of Jesus is an indication of the glorifying divine love of the elect for a future life. Therefore, the Sacred Heart is a demonstrative sign of that reward of which eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it ever entered into the hearts of human beings of just what it is that God has in store for them. We read 1 Corinthians 2.9 from Isaiah 64.3 or Jeremiah 3.16. The sacramental graces that are poured into the believer is also a kind of prognosis of the life <coughs> ahead that will know no end. Sacramental grace in this sense is a hope for eternal life in the earthly liturgy we share in a foretaste of heavenly liturgy which is celebrated in the holy city of Jerusalem toward which we now journey as pilgrims where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. This is the Catechism 1090. The vocation to eternal life is supernatural. It depends totally on God's gratuitous initiative, for he alone can reveal and give of himself. It surpasses the power of human intellect and will and that of every living creature. New Catechism 1998. Paul offers a glimpse of this great plan of loving obedience offered by God. We know that by turning everything to their good, God cooperates with those who love him, with all those he has called according to his purpose. They are the ones he chose specially long ago and intended for them to become true images of his son so that his son might be called the eldest of many brothers and sisters. That's Romans eight twenty-eight and following. My voice seems to be fading, so maybe I will too. Well, so you would like to uh, conclude a bit the the lecture for today. Uh, we're at a good stopping point, mm-hmm. and uh, so we'll, we will. We'll give your voice a, a little bit of rest, please. Mm-hmm. But do you have enough to conclude us with a prayer? Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Church. Please pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. And thank you once again for teaching, and we hope your voice recovers its usual strength for us tomorrow. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.